So I think we are in this uh, terrible situation now where um, people don't want to talk about imperialism. And as I said, it is understandable when you think of uh, the, the last 43 years, the, a generation has been brought up who's got all these empty slogans. And on the other hand, um, it is facing uh, serious economic uh, problems, but it is also facing uh, a very um, uh, dangerous situation in itself in terms of its daily routine. So it goes out in the park, it can get a he or she can be arrested because they are uh, not adhering to the right clothes, they can't drink, they can't go together to a, an event and so on. So if you like the personal um, uh, the personal uh, opposition to this is also uh, part of the problem. Um, and of course, they, the Iranian people have been bombarded, especially in the last few years, uh, with US um, paid, Israeli paid, Saudi paid TV stations, social media um, that uh, constantly tells them the virtues of liberal democracy, civil society, how women's rights are all perfect in the West. It's only the Islamic Republic and Taliban who are very different entities, whether you like it or not, but they're very different entities. They are anti-women, but of course, the West is so progressive, it's pro-women and so. And I think I would have thought that under such circumstances, the role of the radical left must be to expose the fallacy of these um, slogans, these claims uh, that everything is perfect in the West, the streets of London are paved with gold, and all you need to do is have liberal democracy. And you keep telling, asking people inside Iran, well, give me an example of this liberal democracy in the third world where people vote and then get their uh, elected representatives and so on. And um, no one talks about it. And this radical left, does this ex-radical left, left. is not capable of using terms such as colonialism or imperialism. And it just shows how far to the right, how pro-US or accepting of the general, uh, if you like, pro-West agenda they have become. And so, yes, I did hear the arguments between the nationalists and the today. It's an old, it's a very old argument. Who is to be blamed? Because I'm not sure if you are aware, but over the last 70 years, hundreds of books have been written about the 1953 coup. Um, there are academics who've made careers writing about 1953 coup. And the debate is still there. Whose fault was it? So according to Mossadegh supporters, the nationalists, uh, today who had young officers um, uh, groups in the Iranian army successfully managed to stop the coup in late July and even two days before the actual 19th coup, right? 19th of August coup. Uh, but, um, so the accusation is, but you didn't tell us about the actual day, the final day of the coup. So that's the nationalist accusation. The two-day accusation response is well, Mossadegh never wanted to get us, uh, uh, was too uh, pro-American, didn't want to accept that there were two-day 
uh, delegates in the parliament. Uh, therefore, um, um, we were not in a position to help you and so on. And ironically, and I, uh, I've been reading some of this stuff recently, actually, Mossadegh, as a nationalist himself, Iran's national front, and two, they have had close family relations because they were Vargas. Right? So, according to uh, Behut, who is a journalist, analyst, on the, uh, and who is related to both sides, uh, a veteran Iranian journalist, apparently on the day of the coup, um, Mariam Piris, who is a well-known figure of the Tudor party, uh, phoned Mossadegh's house and actually did warn him. So there are all sorts of um, machinations. The reality is that, in, uh, in my humble opinion, not being an expert on the subject and not having made an academic career, uh, both sides were at fault. The nationalists didn't want to have anything to do with Tudor because they thought then they would be associated with Iran moving to the socialist camp. Tudor uh, had its own problems. This is 1953, the year of the death of Stalin. And this is a party that until then, if it rained in Moscow, they were carrying umbrellas in Tehran. So suddenly they lost the direction of who's telling them what to do. And there is a very well, a very um, uh, critical situation, and um, and I think there there is many fault. There are many mistakes of today long before that that uh, I don't I, I don't have time to go to, but I've written a lot of that. And I think that's why, in many ways, uh, someone in the audience uh, in the meeting I was on Tuesday asked. I think this was probably, hopefully, a young person. What's the relevance of 1953 to now? And my response was, well, there is a very significant um, importance because it tells us our own history, but it also shows more than anything else the, the stupidity of this claim that uh, uh, the West wants democracy or human rights or civil society in the Middle East. They did, and they had the chance because they destroyed. And its effect, as Essen rightly pointed out, wasn't just about Iran. Uh, you have to look at a lot of events. You can't turn the clock back, but you can look at a lot of events in Iraq, in Turkey, in various other countries, and say that that paved a pattern, created a situation where uh, who's became part of uh, day to what well, in the case of Iran year to Iraq year to year event in the case of Turkey the military took the power and so so having done this speech which maybe took longer than I expected I want to talk about the protests in Iran we are approaching the anniversary of Massani's killing by the morality player police almost a year ago, September 2022, which sparked protests in almost every province, every district in Iran. Um, and it, 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 and the, I think the young were in the forefront of those protests. Uh, university students were in this, but there was also um, a support, a solidarity by older people who had been forced to be quiet for the last 43 years and suddenly were doing, were facing a different situation. Um, and they could see that the young aren't tolerating this, so they were joining these protests. Um, there's been many attempts by Raisi and other uh, government officials, speeches by Khamenei saying this is all a plot by the West. And he said, well, I think the West can do a lot of plots, but this one doesn't look like it. But because it has so much support, you know, um, uh, There's been a lot of attempt to force women uh, back into the heads, 
back to where we had a headscarf and there's some going on now. Uh, from encouragement to arrest to um, threats to forcing women to wash their dead bodies in the morgue as punishment for not wearing the headscarf, women attending psychiatrists or psychologists to be educated as to, as to the importance of wearing the job. But so far, you can say none of these, both the threats, the arrest, and the, uh, if you like, uh, uh, softer approaches haven't worked. And in some ways, from what I can hear is from the side of art, and I can only rely on the people I listen to and that the stuff that I read from people commenting inside the country, it's a bit too late. The horse has bolted, basically, in terms of headscarf, the horse has bolted. Raisi can try and close the stable door. It's too late. It's not going to work. There are different estimates about how what percentage of women wear headscarf or don't wear headscarf. Clearly, in the affluent suburbs, and that's important to emphasize, it is the affluent suburbs. More than eighty percent of women of all ages haven't worn a headscarf since September twenty twenty two. Whether the new restrictions will change that, I don't know. While in the more traditional suburbs, in the shanty towns, that figure is down to 20%. And again, it's very difficult to say if this is simply, I don't think that's simply state pressure, it's also social and family pressure. So if you live in a traditionally um, religious suburb of Iran, you are unlikely to uh, uh, want to um, uh, go out without a headcloth because your neighbors might uh, be upset, not just the state. So there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of resentment, and there's a lot of support for it. Um, and the first question we must ask ourselves is, how did this spread so fast? How did it become so nationwide? And here, of course, the fundamental reason on the headscarf. You know, it's a bit like um, there are a lot of uh, quotes from Orhan Hamut that comes to mind. But, you know, as he says, the headscarf is just a representation of the issue of headscarf. It's a, a representation of many problems. There is mass unemployment, there is fire and inflation. There, are, there is the economic disastrous effects of sanctions, which can't be now. Um, but in addition to all of this, there is the intervention of religion in the daily life, the private lives of individuals that has added to this dissatisfaction. I've said it, I've said this before, and I repeat it that in most pro-West dictatorships, um, and it, 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 most dictatorships, but especially the pro-West dictatorships, the rulers are quite cunning in that they suppress political opponents, they don't allow people to um, go on strikes, they ban political gatherings and so on, but on average they don't interfere in people's private lives. Uh, in fact, the Shah's regime is a good example. They encourage people uh, to be involved in as superficial and bizarre entertainment that you can imagine, uh, both for the upper classes and the lower class. And that was to stop people becoming political, because once you let people do what they want, then they're not daily confronting the religious state. While the Islamic Republic is, is very different in, from the day it came to power, it wanted to change the, um, if you like, it, it did want to turn the country into a, a truly Islamic country. Now, whether they were unfortunate because there had been decades of secularism, or, uh, and it's difficult to reverse the thing back, or um, there were other factors that didn't help them, the war against Iraq, the war Iran-Iraq war later, uh, pressure from the West and so on, but they, ha they haven't succeeded. And because of this, there is this um, dissociation 
between the, the government, the, the supporters of the government, the sons and daughters of senior Ayatollahs, and the religious state. And yes. that is what make what is making people very angry. Why are they angry? Because in addition to corruption, they see the hypocrisy of a state that tells them to behave in one way, but behaves in a different way in private, in their own circles. And I don't think this started with the first day of the Islamic Republic. This is something that has evolved. I have no idea about the urban arms set up in Turkey, but in Iran, people look at, for example, the fact that distribution of alcohol, which is forbidden in Iran, is actually managed, it's actually um, <laughs> organized by the by sections of the Revolutionary Guard. Now, whether they, I don't, I'm not accusing them to do this with the authority of the senior imam, but everyone in Iran knew from very early 1980s that if you wanted to get alcohol, the best place to get it was from the Revolutionary Guard because they had confiscated alcohol from some people. They were selling it on the black market. There are accusations, I don't know if it's true or not, that this whole epidemic of blindness caused by um, poisoned alcohol, which is currently a problem in Iran and has taken the lives of many people, is again another offshoot of somebody making money uh, connected with the circles of the government. Uh, but then we have, for example, in the last months, we have the hypocrisy of this issue of uh, the man who is in charge of morality guidance in the northern provinces of Iran. He's not just an, an ordinary person. He is in charge. He is called uh, responsible for morality. There's a video of him on social media in a homosexual act with somebody else, right? And this is in the week where the Iranian president is in Uganda telling the Ugandan president Ah, uh, this homosexuality is a disease that the West, with which the West wants to poison the third world. You know, so the hypocrisy is so obvious. It so it hits you, you know, in the face on a daily basis. So there is, it's very difficult to um, find anything to defend about this government, to be honest. And um, after decades of corruption after decades of uh, um, hypocrisy, after trying to change people's lives, not succeeding, and then to a certain extent, the state accepting the reality. So people have double lives, even long before mass events in September 2022, people have double lives. They, consumed what they wanted in their house. They went to a restaurant, pretended they were having tea, and the restaurant earlier did bring tea pots full of wine, right? And the state knew this. This is not something you would do that the state would know, but the state accepted this. Things got slightly tougher when Raisi came to power, because obviously he is more fundamentalist than Rouhani was or Fatani was. The reformists were more tolerant of these types of double life. But at the same time, I don't think people's lives changed dramatically. Um, so in some ways, the Islamic State is in this uh, really uh, unbelievable situation where on the one hand, um, it, it, it has, uh, it can't do anything uh, except uh, 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 live with the status quo, live with what's going on. But on the other hand, it is facing a major uh, rebellion in the country. And in this rebellion, I think if it retreats, which the reformists are telling it retreat, just let them do what it's not, let them not do If it does retreat, it will. Uh, it will lose power. I think it will be in a very difficult situation. On the other hand, um, if it goes to further uh, repression, 
which is some factions of the regime are suggesting you're too soft, you should just uh, take, instead of taking women to guidance or psychiatrists, take them to every prison, just publicly hang a couple of them, and that will solve the problem. But the regime is not that stupid to do that. So I think we are in a situation where we really don't know how this will evolve. It's very difficult to assess the support and the base of the regime, but I don't think we should underestimate those people whose existence, whose livelihood depends on the religious state. And they will support it, and in my opinion, they will fight to the last uh, drop of their blood for the Islamic Republic because they have no other choice. And part of the problem is that the entire opposition, including the left, is very good at underestimating this force. We should never underestimate this force. And why do I say that the support for the regime is really uh, much lower than anyone can imagine? Well, I have good reasons. One of them is that, well, the Islamic Republic had, even the Islamists in 1979 had very clear slogans, you know, um, freedom, um, uh, independence, were at the, and the Islamic Republic, right? They, it was their slogan, never mind what the left was saying. Well, there isn't much independence. The reason the sanctions are so effective is because Iran is so much part of global capital capitalist system, how much Iran relies on exports to the West, imports from the West, that sanctions has crippled the economy just to a certain extent. There was the talk of, um, uh, so I don't think independence has happened. Freedom has definitely not happened. And although uh, you can't say politically Iran is less free than the Shah, because during the Shah's period, you could be arrested for reading a pamphlet. Nowadays, there are websites in Iran that publish leftist journals. There are leftist websites, and the state doesn't care about them, mainly partly also because the left is weak. But there is a reality that there are, uh, our journal receives regularly articles that are what I would call Marxist articles from academics inside Iranian universities. So political freedom in that way is less strict than the Shah's time. But if you organize, if you're trying, if you're a trade unionist trying to go on strike, you have no freedom. If you are a teacher who wants to meet with other teachers to set up even a syndicate, you don't have freedom. But to read and write, you have more freedom than before, I think. I think. But uh, there is no, then on the other, on the other side of it, in the street, you have no freedom. I mean, lots of people were arrested for not adhering to fasting during Ramadan. And of course, this is a country where the young don't fast, so forcing it wouldn't help anyone. And then there was the question of, Although the Islamic Republic never claimed to be, um, uh, how should I put this, it never claimed to be um, uh, socialist or left wing, but Khomeini talked of uh, bringing to power the disinherited. This was going to be the, the those who were uh, um, sh uh, shoeless, the people who had no shoes, who couldn't afford to, sh to wear shoes. Um, the poor, basically. And of course, that and that respect, the situation is far worse than it was ever in the, I think, probably, I don't know, in, at least in the last century since having been this bad. Iran is now, has a Gini factor of 42, one of the highest in the region. And we have the super rich who are mostly, not all, I would say, but mostly related to Syria and to Allah's leaders, commanders of the revolutionary guard. And then we have the rest of the population and the middle class that tries to live with all the uh, contradictions, but isn't happy. Um, and 
for all the, this uh, uh, anti-US rhetoric, Iranian people fight the social media again, or exposed by various people are well aware that these senior Ayatollahs have owned a fight for green cards, their relatives living in the US, for all the anti-US slogan. They have learned the lesson of, I assume, Russian oligarchs. So they're preparing their future, or they learned from the Shah's family, who took the money out before they were overthrown. Uh, but whatever, they are all, um, they are all in this situation. Uh, and I think that um, we have to admit that these protests are probably numerically smaller than the protests of 2011, the USAC degree movement, when the elections, before the elections led to Ahmed Nejad coming to power. But they are more widespread and they are more, if you like, the, the, the entire country is involved in this uh, protest in small parts, in areas that are um, uh, uh, you don't expect demonstrations, like a religious uh, part of Rome, a religious city, or Mashhad, which is another religious city, or the eastern uh, provinces of uh, South near the border with Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and here, I think women have played a very effective role, and it has been important that women have been involved in this, but in some ways, the role of women in these protests in itself shows the contradictions of the Islamic Republic. Because the Islamic Republic is not the Taliban. If you remember when we used to go to stop the war coalition meetings and on behalf of Hoji trying to join stop the war, they had seen speakers told us that uh, our women are freer in Iran than they are in the UK. There's so many, there's more, there's more women students in Iran. And it's true, there are, the percentage of women students is very high in Iran. I think it's 60% of any university student. And in subjects such as the STEM subjects, science, everything, and that, uh, there are a lot of women students. I, I, I gave you the example of the 55 and three women. Well, Iran is not this way. However, that does, and, and in a way, the, the Islamic Republic has been very good at publicizing its, uh, uh, I don't know, its women, the fact that it has women students. They send women mathematicians to the Olympiad with maths. They give you uh, a proof of that triumph center. But that is not the full story. The real story is that legally, in terms of day-to-day -day life, women have a lot of restrictions. Um, the law on divorce is against women. Uh, the simple law of the judicial law about death. So if you kill a man, um, um, I think one relative, two relatives of the man have to be accept pesos, which means you give money instead of the uh, death of the death. And then on the case of women, it's one, or it's very often it's forgotten anyway. Uh, but in the case of um, uh, inheritance, that's true. In the case of divorce, there is constantly battles about this. And very often, children are given to the lead man unless they are under two. So uh, I, it is correct to say that there is a level of uh, the levels of discrimination against women, despite, if you like, all that student population is, um, is quite bad. The, in terms of labor rights, when the wonderful neoliberal governments of the reformists exempted the workshops where women of less than 10 employees were no longer part of the labor law. Iran's labor law is pretty weak, but even that, for that, they exempted workshops of less than 10 employees. So you could work 20 hours in 24 and get paid nothing, and you were exempt the workshop only to say, but I'm not even part of the labor legislation. That really affected women. 
because we're in there, we work into small workshops and they were uh, a kind of situation. So you could say that um, um, you, you can't really equate this number of students with real jobs for them. Of this 60% students, they, as they graduate, they find serious discrimination in finding their job, apart from restrictions, the fact that if they are state employees, they have to wear the headscarf, um, then all the regulations about marriage, divorce, all sorts of other things affect their life. There are people who have said, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not necessarily a fan of this term, but poverty has more victims definitely amongst women. And in, in Iran, but that I think you could say families are poor. So women appear to be more affected by it because they are the ones who are queuing for bread, they're the ones queuing for food, and they are more seen on the scene as people were complaining about rising prices, lack of food. Lack of food is a real serious problem. I mean, during COVID, there was no, um, many of the uh, basic um, medications, not just vaccine, became unavailable because of sanctions. And um, although some vaccines went to Iran, not all vaccines, uh, some countries refused to send vaccines to Iran. And it, the number of deaths from COVID in Iran is higher than the percentage of the population is higher than its neighbors. Uh, there is a serious, and people go, if you read the Iranian papers and social media pages, you realize people have keep uh, uh, cutting back on what they can't eat. So obviously they can't afford meat. Then they went for eggs, then there was a shortage of eggs. Then they started eating pasta and rice. And rice is expensive. And some of these economic problems aren't just sanctions. Sanctions play a part. But it's also the economic policies of the regime. So the government has bankrupted rice um, deliberately, sectionized in sections of the government, bankrupted uh, uh, rice growers in, because part of the regime was importing importing rice on a uh, state exchange rate, which is a lot less than the uh, uh, unofficial real uh, dollar rate, and selling it at the real dollar rate. So you buy, say, I don't know, it's a kilo of rice from India uh, or Pakistan at uh, 10 pounds, that would be, say, I don't know, 2002 months in Iran, you would sell it at 50,000. So you can see how you would, because the official, the government rate and the real rate is that silly. I mean, it goes up. Currently, a dollar, I think it's 46,000 shillings, one dollar. And just to give you an idea of how things have changed, I think in 2000, even in 2007, it probably was 15,000. So, and people have to import. This is a country that's import. So people then started cooking macaroni, which is not exactly an Iranian dish with tomato sauce to make up. And they can't even afford that. So the economic situation here is, is dire. And, um, and I think in this respect, um, working class women are seeing the effects of livelihood and their rebellion and the Mahsa protests, the protests that started in September 22, galvanized all of this uh, and all of this anger, economic problems, legislation problems, well, the interference of state in every aspect of people's private lives and so on. And yeah, I'm gonna cut short some of what I have. Um, it is true that over the last uh, 11 months, we have seen these protests growing far beyond the question of headscarf. 
um, and we have seen workers who had their own disputes. Most of the time, I emphasize defensive disputes. Defensive means that they are demanding unpaid wages. They're not even asking for pay rises. They are demanding uh, uh, better working hours. For example, in Iran, two weeks ago, the heat was so much, 50 degrees in some parts of the oil policy, where the government was forced to give a two-day national holiday weekly, and the exemption were oil workers. Now, if you work, if you're an oil worker in an exploration job, you are in above 50 degrees. So, you know, there were serious protests by workers saying, we give two days to office workers, and we are here we are in 50 degree temperature. But there are also defensive uh, protests by steel workers, by uh, sugarcane workers. The teachers joined the, the protest. The teachers became quite important in the protest because on the one hand, they were sympathizing with school students who were refusing to wear headscarf. And then the police was coming into the school and saying, why is this your uh, why is the school not enforcing the hijab? And the teachers uh, started getting involved and supporting their students. In fact, there are examples, videos of uh, collaboration between school staff and students pushing out representatives of the state who are trying to enforce the headscarf. But uh, teachers have also got other complaints, and that is. Um, Again, something that in most dictatorships doesn't happen in this way, the interference of the state in terms of the curriculum. So the state is trying to say, you know, you can't teach this, you can't teach this, you have to teach uh, Islam in this way and so on. And that has created an additional uh, uh, protest as well. So I, I want to concentrate a bit on who is opposing uh, the regime from inside Iran, from outside Iran. Inside Iran, obviously, this has regenerated the revived the reforms. And you then think, well, you know, you have hundreds of thousands. Mr. Mossad, we had hundreds of thousands on the streets of Tehran in 2009. And he just couldn't separate himself from the Supreme Leader. He couldn't say, down with the Supreme Leader. It's, I mean, at times it might be important, but <laughs> not too much. But, you know, he, uh, the reformist in Iran sees themselves part of the Islamic Republic and yet not part. And as a result of this, the fact that now, for example, uh, as a, every now and then there are these headlines, uh, uh, Musabi tells the police to stay with the people. What does it mean? I mean, does it mean you actually open fire on the um, authorities? Does it, what does stay with the people mean? So even now, there is that element. But there is a revival of the reformist, Khatami, Iran's ex president, the first reformist president, who must be the Iran. Uh, has uh, in the last few weeks said something that has been picked up by a lot of people. He says, uh, if the Islamic Republic insists on enforcing the hijab, it would be self overthrown. The Farsi word is for the Baman dots. It means it would self destroy. And I think um, uh, he might not be the brightest of the uh, I have told us, but he's got it right. I mean, if the Islamic Republic really wants to enforce this, they will self destroy. There are other issues that I haven't covered, uh, but are also important, and that is the issue of national divisions in Iran. And um, the Iran is made 50% uh, Persian, but there is the Azerbaijanis, there is uh, Kurds, uh, Arabs. Uh, Baluchis, so quite a diverse population. Modern capitalism and the fact that, uh, as I said, 80% of the population is urbanized means that there's been huge migration from all of these regions into major cities. So dividing, you know, who are the Kurds in Tehran and the Turks in 
if the Persians in Tabriz, it's going to be difficult. But clearly, one of the attempts of at least sections of the West, and here I would classify them as neoconservative Republicans in the US and the Israeli state, and until recently, but maybe still Saudi Arabia, their attempt over the last 11 months has been very clear. If you listen, uh, which I definitely don't, but I knew what people quote from this um, NBS TV. It used to be called Saudi TV. Uh, now we know it's actually, uh, according to Haaretz, I don't know, but according to Haaretz, it's actually a TV station very well connected with Mossad. This TV station 24 7 is publicizing division of Iran. And again, it's so overwhelming that uh, even sections of the left are going along with it. Yeah? And um, so this scenario would basically break Iran into five, six, I don't know, seven countries, because I think the southern Kurds and the northern Kurds are very split from each other. They, they don't like each other. I live in Kurdistan. I can say this with rather a level of certainty that the southern and northern Kurds will fight each other. Um, so the, this would be divided, and as far as the as far as neocons are concerned, despite the fact that they get paid to go and speak for Mojahedin at one million dollars a time, as Mike Pence did, but um, despite that, the neocons policy regarding Iran is let's divide it into lots of countries. The problem will be so Israel will be happy, Saudis will be happy. We will never, never, ever have to worry about this country. And I think there is an element of uh, what Michael always says, revenge amongst these people. They haven't forgiven the Iranian people for overthrowing their puppet shop. <laughs> and that's the... So that's the uh, scenario. My understanding, and again, I might be wrong because I read the um, leftist articles uh, from inside Iran as well as the listening to what people say about following the TV station. But my understanding is that this hasn't succeeded. In The reason it hasn't succeeded is uh, uh, we don't hear uh, pe this slogan picking up. They do, they do a lot of publicity, but it hasn't really picked up. In fact, Massa Amin was a curve, and some of the bigger protests were in Turkish and it was more than Iran. Um, and we hear slogans of solidarity between Turks and Kurds, between Persians and Kurds. So it, a lot of the money has been invested, a lot of airtime has been invested in creating these divisions. I think they haven't worked. I mean, I read articles um, from Iran where people say it looks like we are in the post nationalist uh, struggles. I mean, we've gone beyond this division of let's divide everything into small nations and so on. That Iranians themselves are seeing themselves more as citizens of a united country. This doesn't mean the left hasn't got serious issues about not understanding the grievances of national minorities that have faced decades of underdevelopment. Um, natural, cultural, um, and at times religious discrimination, like the Kurds or the Banjis, who some of whom are Sunni and therefore in the Shia state have been deprived of basic rights. And, so. um, and um, last but not least, I think we also have to refer to the opposition abroad. And the good news, I think, is that, uh, at least as far as I can see, is that despite all the money that has been spent by various powers, despite the publicity that has been given in various human rights circles to the extras, son, I mean, imagine you're defending human rights and you bring the son of a dictator to replace the Islamic Republic, and this is supposed to be human rights. Despite all of this, so <clears throat> far, he created very quickly this uh, national assembly. This was the national coalition, yeah, uh, 
And it was mainly celebrities, because you obviously can't unite two, part two parties together. There are you know, the Shah dissolved parties and had one party system. So, so he's got, he had these, um, an actress whose claim to fame is I don't know, some hearing the news. Another woman who used to be a supporter of the Islamic Republic and now has become women's rights defender. And the, and the guy who's, uh, who represented the families of the Ukrainian air disaster. Anyway, this alliance, which was supposed to be with uh, the British um, sections of the right wing British press, but especially the Persian speaking uh, BBC, the Voice of America, Radio Israel, Saudi TV, and so on, were presenting this as here you are. There's no problem. The alternative exists. We have the regime to replace the Islamic Republic. And through their own incompetence and the fact that the guy is a complete useless idiot, that is, um, it has collapsed. So one, one person left after Reza Pahlavi made the serious mistake of visiting the Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. Another one left because she thought she wasn't being helped. And I think here you have indi uh, corrupt individuals who are being paid by various US Zionist neoconservative think tanks and whose personal interest uh, even goes beyond the possible. They, when they see this alternative is going nowhere, they do. Um, so in some ways, it is good that we don't have, if you like, we are not facing a ready-made alternative. We, are, we don't have um, someone claiming to be the leader of this movement. The slogan used uh, by Massa Amini supporters originally is a PKK slogan, but the right that picked it up didn't even know that this was a PKK slogan. So you can see how stupid uh, life, woman, freedom is. And there are serious problems with this slogan, but uh, um, it is better than some of the slogans that who could have been picked up. Uh, like the royalists' initial attempt was to change this to Iran nation man or something like that. It was stupid. I mean, that was uh, it. Didn't last long. But it has limits, and the left has not really, in my opinion, the left hasn't criticized this, the, the lack of clarity of this slogan uh, to the extent that it should. So that we have hours of discussion of various radical left spokespeople praising this slogan, but we don't have their understanding of what it means. They talk about women's oppression in Iran, but they don't mention anything that you could consider left of center. Don't mention angels. Don't mention the origins of family. Never mind Clara Zetkin or uh, you know, Rosa Luxemburg. So the radical left is very conservative, in my opinion, in its approach to the protest movement. It's taming the movement. It's not it's not, I don't think, I mean, it's not obviously in a position to lead the movement, but it can intervene in a more positive, in a more radical way. And all they do is they say, oh, well, it's good there is no leadership, but the leadership would develop automatically from within the protest. And you say, well, give me an example where, you know, suddenly from nowhere, and with people like you being so soft, so pro-West, so shy about saying anything about imperialism, colonialism, or Marx, never mind Marxism, um, that rad radical leaders have uh, stemmed from the um, lower ranks of the protest movement and have taken us uh, to uh, Nirvana. And then we have Tude who repeats the slogan uh, that it has always had, and it did have it under the shock. Um, united Front Against Dictatorship. Yeah, and it was such a success because we were United Front of today against the Shah was to ally itself with Khomeini. 
And okay, then they allowed themselves to have many suppressed and killed thousands of left wingers, and then Khomeini went for that. And by that time, there was no one left to defend them. But now, to repeat this slogan, let's unite what united for, with who, with which classes, on the basis of which principles, for what reason are we creating this uh, united for? It's amazing that you can make the same mistakes twice and not think of it. So the future is very unclear. I'm, uh, I've run out of time, so I don't want to say too much, but I think the future is very unclear. It doesn't mean it's all negative. I am concerned, and I, I chose the title deliberately about the failings of the Iranian left because at a time when the Iranian left is not in a position to lead the movement, but is in a position to give it, to intervene in a more positive, in a radical way. We are facing uh, a situation where on the anniversary of 1953, I have so far seen one uh, interview, and even that is re reduced to item six, seven of the webpage of Radha on 1953. We are facing a situation where the consensus of the right that the West and democracy must be better than what we have has affected the subconscious, if not the daily actions of the Iranian left. And we are faced with uh, uh, what, what I would call uh, uh, but still uh, not, not to be underestimated to the who is um, calling for a united <laughs> So in those circumstances, the possibilities are very limited, but the, in my opinion, the state will try and uh, show uh, its force in September because it can't let the current situation go, and it will face other protests. Uh, the latest news is that there is a shortage of petrol in Iran, in a, country that is an oil producing country, there are queues around petrol stations. And this is partly because they are so desperate they have to sell everything abroad. And the government is still in this really silly position where it keeps begging, it's now begging the US to do a deal with it. And it is the constantly it's the US that doesn't want to deal with Iran. So we are, last week there was um, the American prisoners in Iranian jails were released for, uh, from prison to house arrest. And I think a similar thing happened to Iranian prisoners in the US. So the Netanyahu nightmare scenario of the exchange of prisoners seems to be days away. I, my understanding is in days that will happen, or at least in a couple of weeks. And that releases six billion dollars of Iranian um, funds in South Korea. South Korea. This is part of a complicated deal that Iran and the US make this prisoner exchange. Uh, Qatar is the go-to. South Korea releases the Iranian funds. They are frozen because of US sanctions. In Israel, the uh, pirates and some papers are saying this is the first step towards a nuclear deal. The US says, no, that's not necessarily the case. Iran internally, because it's so desperate to pacify its own population, is claiming this is the first step to the nuclear deal. So I don't know if they do get a deal, if they do release money, they might lengthen their time. But on the other hand, I don't think the position taken by sections of the Iranian left that increased sanctions gives a better chance to protesters is really correct. I don't think you increase the misery of ordinary people and necessarily end up with a revolution. You can end up with despair. You can end up with disaster. You can end up with regime change from above. And okay, Reza Pahlavi has now proved himself to be completely useless, but I'm sure the US will find another alternative for Iran. So the idea is that the more misery for the people, the better the situation is also a silly idea. And in this uh, dilemma, 
um, the, the future is very unclear. I'm sure I've missed a lot of issues, but I will 